All right, everybody. Good morning. Uh, this is the Assembly and Enterprise and Utility Oversight Committee um, for October 17th, 2019. We'll start by taking the roll. Ms. Kennedy. Crystal Kennedy. Pete Peterson. Forrest Dunbar. Austin Clay Davidson. Suzanne LaFrance. Christopher Constant. Bill Paul Sadie, Municipal Manager. Bill Wilkes, Parish Blessing and Associates. Red Dice. All right, might as well go around the room. Make it quick, though. Alex, let's get to the You can call Hayden to represent myself. Bert Manning, the FSC. Lev Ian Volsky, Petra Starnik. Mark Schimmersheimer, Abu. Tom Ritter, Last American. Jason Bach, the Chief of Staff of the Mayor. Oh, Mark Spafford, General Manager, SWS. I think members of Finance Director, Paul Quaid. Sandy Baker, Public Outreach, Cambridge Farm Waste Water Utilities. All right, hello everybody. So we have three items on the agenda, a very brief briefing on the Ford Tariff, which will lead us into a larger conversation in the short term. Uh, an update on the solid waste service rate proposal ordinance 2019-126 and then a conversation about the stormwater utility planning and implementation scope of work and then any other items that might come up so uh, mr falsey why don't you take the con we'll do and i know we have three chunky topics on the agenda today so we'll try to move through them pretty quickly this is really in the nature of coming attraction and making sure all of the public knows what is going on on October 10th, I sent a letter to the port commissioners, which I cc to the port user group and to the assembly, reminding everybody that the current Port Alaska tariff, that thing which sets our wharfage and dockage and preference disagreement type uh, fees, is set to expire on the end of the year. So the, right now there is a table that does not have charges after 2019, which means before the year's end, we have to have something in place. Um, that means that we have big decisions to be made, and the process for that is that it goes to the Port Commission uh, and their meeting October 23rd. In the past, our practice has mostly been in the main to say, we thought about it, here's what we recommend, this is our up or down proposal, um, here's what you need to do to keep the lights on and pay for all your deferred maintenance. Uh, we know that we're in a different space this year, and so rather than uh, waiting until the 23rd to bring a single rock to the Port Commission and say, let us have this, we instead sent out this early uh, with advance notice, and we have a range of options that in the main divide into four, which map onto options for the modernization program and the petroleum cement terminal. Right now, I'm not gonna go all the way into the weeds because this is just a coming attraction, but to begin to describe this for you, the four options are really a baseline, just kind of keep the lights on. This, we've already procured the petroleum cement terminal 2020 construction. We'd end up with this platform and the trestle, but we would otherwise be out of money. We wouldn't have anything else to do. Um, you could go all the way to the end. You could say, I'm just gonna completely finish out the petroleum cement terminal. You would have to make tariff adjustments that would enable us to raise, what we think, $80 million. I don't know that that's going to be palatable. It might even be pretty challenging to get consensus on that because we don't yet know if our federal grants that we have asked for are going to come in. Um, short of that, those are sort of the football field. From, it's all the way from the you know one one touchdown zone, one end zone to the other end zone. Um, there are two options that are sort of natural options, and we wanted to model both of these. You could build it all the way and make it functional for cement. So you could say, I'm going to build out these dolphins and the catwalks and all the things you would need to actually put a vessel at the front of that berth. And then uh, the cement work is actually brought over by ABI, they can move. So that would make this fully functional for cement. That's a $60 million um, endeavor. And it would not yet get you the host tower or the operations building, that's what's missing from that platform. So you wouldn't be functional for petroleum, but you would have a dock that would be in service for cement. Short of that, you could say, um, what I, want to protect now is we have applied to the National Marine Fishery Service for an incidental harassment permit for beluga whale takes. And our window has been scheduled on a two-year window. You could try to protect that incident harassment permitting work and minimize beluga whale-related permitting risk by just finishing all the in-water work, meaning you build these dolphins, the mooring and resting 
dolphins, and the cat blocks that and connect them, and then you would be done with in-water work. You, the rest of it, you could be building on the top side <coughs> whenever you actually get to farms. So we wanted to build out that range of options with high particularity, and I have sent around with that letter, uh, which is a, on the table back there, a long PowerPoint presentation that Bill Wilkes and his, I think we call them ninjas, have put together um, to model out all those tariffs. You'll see if you flip all the way to the back that we have particular, we have all the scenarios modeled, and then we step them down to show you particularly what happens to petroleum, and you can see the baseline, then the $41 million option, the $60 million option, the $80 million option, and we actually have some subcategories there too, because right now those would say you have a big tariff change in the first year, and then it's sort of systems normal going after that. But you could do it differently, where it ramps up over time and then it elevates off. We also model the scenario where short of getting legislative authority to do something really special with ADA, we could, under ADA's normal uh, <coughs> legislative authorizations, potentially structure a loan with ADA that has a very long financing term, so instead of a 30 or 40 year revenue bond kind of play, you could get a 50 year payback. That might not uh, be overall economically cheaper, but it does change the shape of, of the, the rate changes, and we'll have those conversations with folks about whether those things are attractive. And then likewise, we've got all those laid out for cement as well. The four models that we've given with those different flavors are, are probably the right way to shape the conversation, we think. But you know, anything is possible, so we've also included as, a, as an appendix two different slides to just sort of show if you're just interested in moving the dial and there's another option that we haven't thought of, these are roughly the kinds of money that you could raise by making these kind of tariff adjustments because it is continuous. You could pick kind of any number you want. Um, and, and then the last one, and th these are the 2020 changes, not the 2029 changes for those who are falling into home. Um, and then last, um, one of the suggestions that is in Roaster Jalewski's report is, to say, is that, uh, well, a couple things. We all now believe that the cargo side of the program is kind of back to the drawing board. I think we have in mind ways to skinny the cargo side of the project way down. We don't yet have a consensus on what that's going to look like. There are going to be future roundtables. Tope is doing some homework. We're doing some homework. But we do know it is going to cost something, and it is going to be expensive. And one of the things that Roasters was includes in his report is the idea you might as well begin thinking about making some cargo side tariff adjustments now so that you can start banking money to pay for those. That may not be sensible to say, we will wait to do any fundraising for the cargo side until we know with extreme particularity what we do. We wouldn't likely say we're going to raise $500 million, but maybe you would pick some number further on the left-hand side of the chart. These are all modeling additional surcharges on a 20-foot equivalent unit container, so just put a charge on each box that's coming over <coughs> to the uh, cargo terminal, and these are the kind of funds that you could raise. I'm always trying to make this more tangible for folks, so I said, um, how do you convert what the TEU <coughs> charge looks, feels like to end users throughout the community? We picked milk, so we said, if you assume there was milk in the container, uh, here's what it would look like. Uh, milk is a little bit of a mismatch, because I'm not sure how much milk we can get in cargo containers, but it's also very heavy as compared to other things that are in. Um, but that gives you at least some purchase on that. The purpose of today was just to say, um, to send up a flare to let everybody know who has, was not included on the original email to the Port Commission, to the Assembly, or to the Port Users, this is happening, so that we're gonna have to have this conversation in fulsome detail between now and the end of the year. Um, and to say that we're gonna begin the conversation in earnest next week with the Port Commission. Um, we have said that we completely understand that any tariff adjustments can't be so onerous that they crush the volumes and then put us into a place where we're not actually raising the kind of revenues that we're projecting. And we're going to need help and back and forth with the user groups to help figure this all out. But we are committed to figuring something out in tandem with all of the affected parties. Mr. Dunbar. Thank you, uh, Mr. Huffman. So just a, a really basic question relating this to the work we did this summer in the $42 million contract and the whole process we went through. And am I correct in assuming that, you know, one of our promises during that process is that we would not increase rates to pay for the PCT on cement and petroleum, right? I mean, that was something that we said repeatedly, that we weren't going to do that. We were going to seek other forms of, uh, other forms of revenue. I remember that being in one of our, in a number of our presentations. Am I, mis am I misremembering that? Well, let me make sure I'm understanding you correctly. It was true that the work that is happening next year, the $42 million to, petroleum, 
to a specific pile did not depend on any tariff adjustment. So mm -hmm. that work will happen if you do nothing for petroleum cement tariffs. But the rest of the project, there is no other money for it. So in order to finish the petroleum cement terminal, the money has to come from somewhere. And we've always said that it would come from tariffs, which allow us to raise money, state grants, or federal money. We don't have any state grants or federal grants in hand, although we are applying for federal grants, and we've been talking to everybody we know to talk to about what kind of state grants might be available. I think that there's an emerging consensus that tariff adjustments of some sort are inevitable. But what those are, um, that's what we will start to find out starting October 23rd. It's kind of a quick follow-up to that, Please. Okay, so I thought your answer was going to be, we promised the petroleum and cement users that we basically wouldn't make them fund all or even most of the PCT itself. But rather, this doesn't violate, which I thought was a pretty explicit promise we made to them over the summer, because we're looking at a broader tariff, is that right? That includes cargo. So I, uh, I guess the right way to clarify that is, we never promised there would be no tariff adjustments to finish the PCT. There is definitely going to be tariff adjustments to finish the PCT. We promised that the first phase involved no tariff adjustments, and that the future phases would not involve owners tariff, tariff adjustments. That's even in the resolution that we had everybody pass. It was to say we understand that tariff adjustments cannot be non-economic. But okay, so that's that's, the, that's what it turns on. It's the term non-economic. Yeah, and I I mean if there was not enough clarity on that, then I really apologize. But then that was always very clear to us that there was a certain amount of money. We were not going to ask for more money to finish this first part, but the, the funds have to come from other places to get it. Totally cool. And I mean, the and the rate the the rates we're looking to change right now, the tariff we're looking at right now, is that just petroleum and cement, or is it broader, including cargo? It is everything. Okay. Um, and so the baseline is just keep the lights on. That means everybody's rates change. The add-ons are petroleum and cement on top of those everybody's rates changes, keep the lights on, and then the cargo side would be this 10, this 20-foot equivalent unit charge that attached to the cargo side. Um, we have not modeled blending tariff changes, meaning that the cargo side would now be paying for any <coughs> of the petroleum cement terminal, but maybe that would be part of what comes up in this conversation going forward. So thank you, uh, thank you Mr. Ross. I have one last question, and we're out of time for this topic. Um, and that was back on your graph with the TEUs, um, that piece with cargo. Um, there was no time here. What's the time variable that we're looking at for this revenue? There is no time variable because the way what this is saying is if you put this kind of charge on every box that comes across the docks, you would then get annual revenues in perpetuity that um, would support for borrowing these amounts of money. So I guess if there's any time variable, I suppose in some ways you could say this would be like a 40-year TEU charge because you would need those annual revenues to pay back the bonds for 40 years. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, the, this item is going now before the Port Commission for their investigation and report back to us. Uh, stand by. Um, we will have it before us shortly. And as you can see, the dead drop dead timeline is... December 31, 2019. So we will have something introduced and passed in advance of that. So that's what's coming. Good. Thank you. Next up on the agenda is solid waste service rates. Mr. Spofford. <coughs> Mr. Falsey's uh, five minute benchmark is exceeded. Five is 10.
<laughs> I'm just guessing that we wanted to talk about the uh, financials from last month's meeting, so I'm just going to pull up that portion of the presentation that we made, and then have Heidi go through that again, or you guys can just ask questions, or... So but, but okay. basically, it's just you know this is uh, year two of um, you know the plan that was approved by the assembly last November or December time frame and okay I'll, I can take the lead on yep. this then so at the last meeting we had a briefing on the tariff increases and what its proposal to purchase is this item was put on the agenda because we have an ordinance before us on Tuesday to address the rate increase so I'll just open it up to the members for questions if anyone has any thank you mr. constant I'm just curious if any other members or if um, mr. Stafford, if you received any feedback from the public on this We've, I mean, we've gotten, you know, a couple, I think, comments from Facebook, you know, from our social media postings. Um, I got, we got a comment from one of the haulers, which was the same hauler last year that, um, you know, had said, took exception to us raising our, our disposal rates as well. Um, I think I had another comment from one of the haulers where they were asking us, why did you, you know, do the rate increase all in one lump sum, and it's, you know, because it's not really the best business practice, but they're, they were worried about, you know, they have to pay, you know, whatever thousands of dollars in filings to the RCA to adjust their rates every year. Okay. And so those were kind of like the two big filings, but I don't know how true that last one is, because basically with solid waste haulers outside of uh, the SWS collection area, they're basically given like a range of rates that they can charge, and so, you know, and never having gone through the RCA process, luckily, um, I'm not. I can't. I can't comment on you know like whether that's true or false. But but that, those were those were the, the flavor of the comments that I got that we received. So, Ms. Quinn Davidson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, so I think you talked about this in another work session. I wasn't here and I listened, but it's always it's harder when you're not here in person. So can you just give me the like two minute scoop on what's going on? I know we raised rates last year. Our constituents probably know that too. So this is to build the transfer center and can you sort of give us some of your reasoning on why this makes sense and why it's worth it to people and how to communicate that to the public? I mean, uh, you want to take that from your, we, we basically, we ran, we ran deficits last year. We, we were in the red last year as far as. Our, yeah, um, I remember that, but that was the argument for raising rates last year. Right, and so did you want to go ahead sure. So we proposed last year a kind of a long-term business plan, and we had a slide uh, that is covered up by alerts right now. That I don't know how to get rid of. Okay. We had given a slide that it has been in, in both utilities nearly 10 years, a little less in some places, but nearly 10 years since we had the rate increase. and. Our rate increases were minimal uh, at that time, and then we we helped them study. Last year, <coughs> we did an increase, an incremental increase of five percent for the refuse collection utility and six and a quarter for the disposal utility. But we had also shown you a nifty slide of what the consumer price index has done since years and years and years ago to today versus our tiny incremental rates. And what we wanted to do is not hit our customers with a giant rate increase to adjust to everything we're going to need for operations, um, for retaining 60 to 90 days uh, cash. So basically, <laughs> you only raised it a little bit, but not enough to Correct. break even. Okay, so is this amount to break even on regular services, or is this to build a central transfer station? This, this is both to help to make break even on our services to fund our 60 to 90 days <coughs> operating cash reserves, which is the best business practice of the mm -hmm. Governmental Finance Officers Association, to begin to build a capital fund for emergency and to get us to a position where we can fund capitals 
through our uh, non-cash, so just depreciation, which are all also best business practices. And in the long run, if we raise incrementally over the next few years, and we anticipate we're going to have to do this annually, probably through 2023, 24, we want to do it annually so we can assess it and see if we can um, make it smaller in the future if we do better than we anticipated. But here's kind of a picture of what we thought would happen. So it's to fund all of those things and to set us in a position to be able to meet the debt service once we do construct the new central transfer station um, to fund that. Is there and someone on the phone? Could I ask one more question? Yes, okay. yes. um, so what percentage of what you're raising is due to regular operations versus central transfer station? We have not Roughly. broken the percentage down to those amounts. What we did is assess what we need to begin meeting those goals, and we are not anticipating it's totally meeting those goals, like I said, until 2023 to 2025. So our original business plan was to increase at least for three to four years at the 5% for refuse collections and six and a quarter for disposal. We analyzed where we ended last year, 2018, and we ended spot on with what we projected when we talked to you before the end of 2018. So we believe that our assessment is correct and we need to toe the line and keep it the same for 19 and 20, the increases. And then we can analyze it more for what Right, but people are gonna ask us, increase. what's the increase for? So do you want me to say it's to operate in the, not in the red, which totally makes sense, and it's to build a savings account so that we can do the central transfer station? And people might ask me, oh, well, how much of our rates is for that? And I should be able to answer that. Right. So okay. you don't have to give me an exact percentage, I but say, I think we need more information. I would say for 2020, uh, my answer would be it is so that we do not operate in the red, so right. continue to operate in the black, and so that we begin to build 60 to 90 days cash reserves. We have we dug our cash reserves very low by the end of 2018, and when we mail out a bill, if they have a, a due date before they have to pay it, we need to be able to operate until we collect those receivables. That's really all we're doing. Okay, right so now. right now it's just to not operate in red. Correct. Am I using the right color? Yeah. And to build cash right. reserves so that we can operate in the interim between building that kind of thing. If I might, I believe we funded the transfer station on a debt package, didn't we? Didn't we approve finance for that? And so. So that's, this isn't for the transfer Yeah, station. that's a whole other packet of funds. It's for future operations once it's established and et cetera. But I understand it as we already approved that. This is just for the funding of getting operations up to you. Well, clarity. Um, so what you approved was long-term plan so that they could rebuild the transfer station. We've already started that. You approved the purchase of the Walmart property for $17 million. So we're already incurring interest. So what Heidi is saying is both to get themselves operational but also to provide debt service because they are in the planning process right now of what the new transfer station is going to look like and that's going to step out over the next several years. So these rate increases will cover both operations as well as the debt service. The interest on the... On the debt that they are already incurring. Okay. So it would be fair to say most of it is to make sure you're just operating as Correct. usual. Yes, okay. that is fair. Great. Thank, thanks, Mr. Thank Compton, for that. Ms. Zolotel. Thank, Thank you. Um, so I get a lot of, fr I've gotten a lot of frustration about this. Um, okay. And I think hearing that we're going to be moving this forward over, you know, increases year after year, I'm wondering, is that the only path forward? I understand the desire for responsiveness, but my constituents, especially my older constituents, are very concerned about their bill kind of going up versus I'm wondering if there isn't some alternate method of a percentage per year increase if we can if it could be modeled so it could just be kind of a bit more predictable because they feel like this comes out of nowhere every time regardless of what heads up they might have um, so I just like to hear why we're I mean besides the responsiveness why there isn't an alternative one that might not have us change every year or build in now what kind of increases we might see you know two years or three years at a time so people can plan I, I think that Heidi kind of we explained she explained that a little bit we have 
you know, a long-term financial plan that basically out till 2025, 20 something like that, we've got um, five percent increases in collections, six and a quarter in disposal. And what we do every year is based on how we, you know, once we get our audited financials for this year, we'll go back, enter, enter what the numbers are in our long-term financial plan again for uh, what, how we ended up in 2019 in the 2020 portion to see what we need to ask for in 2021 to cover, you know, operations and the debt service that we have. I have a clarifying question, if I may. Please. Um, so that was helpful. Isn't it possible to basically set a rate schedule for a couple of years? It sounds like you can anticipate what the rates might be and that if there needed to be a significant adjustment, you could seek an amendment to that um, in ordinance um, so that people could kind of plan for a period of time? I, I, I think that's we're doing the best that we can with the financial model that we have right now. And why we want to analyze it every year is because we don't want to go and ask for something over what we really should be asking for to go, you know, again, our operational expenses and our debt service. And so that's why we want to try to reevaluate. That's why we reevaluate that every year. Instead of just asking for, you know, 5% every year, we're going to say we're going to do this for the next, you know, five to six years when we may or may not need that, you know, whole 5% at um, six and a quarter of this whole thing. One follow up to that is. Is there a way to do it maybe earlier in the year? Because also this feels like it's coming on the heels of a lot of individuals' expenses. It's kind of an expensive time of year now and then at January 1 taking effect. But if they had notice further back in the year, they could um, plan a little bit more for it. We we tried to we we did we we had we tried to get this out as soon as we possibly could this year. Um, I don't know Heidi, is there is there kind of a hang up? We need to wait until we get our audited financials and. Well, that's what we did this year is waited until we had the actual results, as close as we could actual results for 2018, and then also until we were able to start closing periods for 2019 to see what 2019 was looking like so that we could assess 2020. There's a chance we that those things will happen quicker next year. I can't really speak to that, so I don't want to make promises for other people, <laughs> you know, but... Um, we hear you and we understand that. Our goal is to get to where it's a study amount that's smaller and closer to CPI. That is our ultimate goal. And so we realize this is a little bit bigger of an increase. What we want to tell you, we think you can tell your constituents is that our plan is for that not to occur for more than three or four years at most, but, and then we're going to bring it back and, and keep it small. But I know that's very yeah, hot. I mean, the reality is senior benefits have been cut, and there are folks just really, I mean, you know, I, I just have a group of constituents that, that are well organized, <laughs> um, but they also barely keep their independence, be, and the small financial impacts are, are significant, so um, I just wanted to kind of explore this a little bit so that I could understand it and try to work with them and explain it to them better, so Mr. thank Paul, you. Mr. Falsey, you had your hand up? And, so. Yeah, and, and, and not, to, not to minimize you know, uh, rate increases, but, you know, for somebody like on the residential side, they're going to see, you know, with our standard type of service, it's going to be, you know, essentially a dollar and 30 cents a month. And not to minimize the importance of that for any any of your constituents or anything like that, but that's that's the magnitude of it. Can you go back to the last slide? Yep. Maybe the middle road is to um, publish some document in the bills that states we have anticipated that over the next four years, we will have to do this process of increasing rates that will flatten out. Instead of actually committing to a rate notifying the public, this rate increase is intended. And in that way, you soften the blow, you communicate it in advance, and people are less shocked when it comes. Because when you see a 5% increase, it scares people, especially when you see it year in and year out. But if you know it's coming and why, maybe it's better. Like I understood, we have this talk last year and it seems like a little Groundhog Day, we're having the same talk again. Like, we need to do this for a few years. And so if that's happening here, then for sure that's happening in the public. Um, so Mr. Dunbar was in the queue. Yeah, thank you. Um, so because we were talking about the planning process uh, for the CTS, and I know it's a little bit um, tangential to this. I mean, it, it is related as, as, uh, um, as uh, uh, tangential, rather. <laughs> I was wondering what you're doing over here. Thank you. Uh, as, uh, thank you, Austin. Awesome. Do you see my I can, I, can, I can see your face out of my eye. Uh, so, um, 
But as she brought up, so we're in that process. I have had one. Uh, I have heard that there are some current concerns about the, the design of the, C, the new CTS that it will have difficulty um, uh, accommodating commercial recycling. Is that something that is on your radar? And can you speak at all to that a little bit? Can you, can you add any more detail to just? I, I, I just I look. It's not something that I have a deep knowledge on, but I have <laughs> a particular constituent who does. And they are like, well, it's going to be difficult for commercial recyclers to use the facility as you have proposed it. We're, I mean, we're so we're at like the ten percent design phase. We, okay. we, what I mean, what a big part of what the, mm -hmm. the project is going to do for us is it's going to give us a lot more flexibility. And so the plan is is to have we're going to have a small um, reuse drop off center, um, you know, for like household hazardous waste and maybe some other. You know, we've had a couple of constituents come in and say, you know, they want to do like bike recycling, and you know, we're going to be able to accommodate stuff like that on the new site. But basically, you have to remember that we're going to be moving from our existing tipping floor to the new tipping floor, and what that leaves is that existing tipping floor for us to do some of those larger scale recycling or diversion activities that we want to do, like organics diversion, which is what we want to do on a much larger scale. So we'll be able to do that. You know, potentially get large. You know, the, the moving companies that just dump all of their cardboard at the landfill will yeah. be able to take them on the tipping floor at the transfer station. We're also I'm trying to talk West Rock, who is the local recycling entity that operates the Anchorage Recycling Center, to see if there's a way that they can partner with us to use some of the facilities like our existing admin building and warm storage building right. to repurpose that to to give them a better facility. Because whenever I go to that recycling center it just reminds me of like Sanford and Son and so if there's a way that we can make it <laughs> okay, better really, for the community really I mean, come, reference. What, to, what do you mean by that well because it's just not very it's nice yeah. it's it's <laughs> it's not uh, inside it's you know it's dirty um, oh, okay. you know it's I don't I don't find it the safest facility it's a good show. And, yeah it's a really good show I've heard it's a good show but I've never seen it. <laughs> It was on the it was on the tail end of like you know my youth. Days. So I, I, Do you I'm have a Simpsons reference? You can use. Exactly. Sanford and Sons were in the Simpsons. Yeah. yeah. No, okay, but, so, I'm, I'm, but I'm trying to work with them to to, to, so meta. to get it so that we have literally like a campus where we get rid of garbage and we also okay. do all of our disposal or recycling activities diversion in one place. So I think that's the central concern is that there there's space at the new CTS to literally have some of these recyclers recyclers be co-located. You said that yes. We are pursuing that. Right. Okay. But what I don't want to do is I'm not a fan of duplicating effort, and so I want to make sure that I exhaust, we exhaust everything with Westrock, who's a private company, yeah. to try to entice them into you know working with us to, to develop a better recycling center on our existing property. Yeah, but that's what I meant. Actually. Yeah. So yeah. Great, great, good to hear that you're doing that. Thank you. All right. So if you don't mind, Ms. Quidditson, we'll go to Mr. Dyson first, and then come back to you. Sure. Thanks. Mr. Dyson. Always glad to yield to Mr. Dyson. <laughs> Just a little teasing. Keep it up. Uh, yeah, so a, a, a bigger picture, um, when you look out at our nation in larger cities, uh, what percentage of them are, are subsidizing the solid waste pickup in your kingdom? Just back of the envelope stuff. Oh, I don't, I don't know. I, I can say from like uh, um, from Matsu, Kenai, and us. Kenai. No, I don't want to know that. Okay. I want to know nationally in that industry. Uh, or, yeah. All right. Can you get back to us with that info? Yeah. Thank but you. But Bill, do you know any? My guess is some cities uh, trying to look out for the poor or whatever are using tax, other tax bases. The subsidized. You got any sense of that at all? I don't. Okay, so we'll get a report on that. It's a good question. <coughs> it's but, hard to answer off the top of their but, head, sure. but it'll help us sell this. Yes. You know. Agreed. And and part of the, uh, the watershed here is we have an area where not everybody is using the service. You know. So if you're subsidizing, that's unfair. Same with the fire hydrants and everything else. And so yeah. maybe by Tuesday you can have a brief update for us before the deliberations. That could be helpful in the conversation. With, uh, with the sub like, amount of subsidized. How other communities address the concern of yeah. A, subsidy, B, taking care of the poor community members? Well, just, yeah, just back the envelope. Don't yeah. spend a lot of time. I just want to know where it, yeah. That's great. By Tuesday, let me hear that report before we finish. Okay. Ms. Quinn Davidson. Yeah, 
Thank you, Mr. Constant. Um, I was wondering if you're planning on including a little flyer or something in the, I, I'm not an SWS <coughs> uh, customer, but when you send out new rates, it would be a great space to just say, hey, we've been operating red. You don't have to say how much you're increasing every year, but this is our plan, just so people aren't caught off guard. Maybe that, and I guess yes. Mr. Constant was <coughs> suggesting that too. And we were planning on doing bill inserts. Awesome. And then my other question is, could you send us a map of where SWS and Alaska Waste service areas are? Yeah, it's on our it's on our website. We'll get that to you. Will you just send the link or something? Yep. Yep. Thank you. No problem. Just from a caring concern perspective, I would say don't put in your flyer that we've been operating in the red. Say we've been operating with limited budget without increases for a long time. Just thought on strategy. <laughs> but you guys do what you do. Anyone else? Miss Kennedy, before we flip over to the final topic. Thank you. Uh, yes, just in regard to the bear carts, um, I noticed that they, I mean, obviously it's already been in the ordinance in terms of um, requiring that people have them unlocked. My understanding is that you want your bear carts to be locked. So anyway, can you kind of tell me a little bit, explain a little bit more about when that would be, somebody might be charged for having their bear cart locked? So how is this actually implemented then? So if I might, I think yeah. we, we had a really robust debate around this topic when we implemented the bear cart process out in Eagle River and some of the other areas. Mm -hmm. And I think that the answer was it was the same day after midnight, right? It has to be unlocked. That was what I understood the decision was, that it couldn't be before midnight. And we went deep into the weeds on this topic, I thought. And so... Not on the idea of so, it being locked. So we, we've... We have a, in our service area, we have a limited number of bear parts. So we, we probably have 250. And so we've educated our customers that they need to unlock the lock the morning that they place their cart out for service. I, I can't think, or I don't know of one time where we <coughs> ever not service somebody's cart because they still had it locked. Our drivers will still go out and unlock for the most part. Um, and, and service the can. I, I just don't know of a time where we haven't serviced somebody's bear cart because it's been locked. My house. Your house it's happened. Yeah, but it's so. obviously in there and you it's get out. charged. Did you get charged? I didn't get charged. So I, I just ignored the can. I didn't ask yeah. them to come back out though. You know, if they had to come back out because I didn't lock my can and I had need, then it would be a different story. And, and so, and it's completely, it's a different operating scenario, like say where you live in, in Alaska Waste. Mm -hmm. They just do things a little bit different you're all also trying to get a different kind of bear cart that has the magnetic unlock mechanism. Or try and so that might these would eventually be phased out. Yes, and that's that's my plan. However, you know, as you can imagine, there's a bunch of different cart manufacturers. Our cart manufacturer is different than Alaska Waste Manufacturer. These type of bear resistant containers are something that's still new, so they're still <coughs> working on the development of a you know, where somebody doesn't actually have to unlock it, whereas when the, the automated side loader comes by, it just picks it up and dumps it. But they're still working on getting it certified because, of course, there's a, you know, international grizzly bear certification that it has to go through in order to, uh, in, in order for them to sell it and say it's IGBC certified. So it's, it's, we're still, like, in the middle of that process. Well, I was just curious about it all because obviously it was important enough to also include raising the fee for that. So um, people will want to know that they need to pay attention to this. So just as a last note on the topic from my personal experience, after we did that whole deliberation, I figured out how my lock works because I didn't know it before and I really wasn't locking it. And the next morning, every trash can on my alley was dumped over except mine was flipped upside down and completely safe and full and so it works when you work it so on that note we'll switch over to our solid waste services conversation a, a stormwater utility conversation and that's phase two planning and implementation i'm sorry we're going <coughs> to rush you for time you get half the time we thought you'd have but um the breaks we can go over a few minutes too, right? Budget I know there's a budget. Today, so. We started late. Like. If you want to go, it's your call. Sure, I can go over.
come back. Well, good morning, everyone. Mark Schimsheimer, uh, Director of Engineering with Daegu. I've got a presentation here on the status report of Phase 2 for the stormwater utility. 12 slides, so it should take us uh, 8 to 10 minutes to get through and then some discussion. So we do it right. We're out of here at noon. And you see, hopefully everyone can see this. Okay, going backwards a little bit, uh, why are we doing this? There's four main reasons why we're doing this, and these are the rationale that come directly out of the January 2019 uh, summary of findings and recommendations report. So I've underlined kind of the main points of this, and I'm gonna go into where we are and what the stormwater utility would do, and these are the main points. So currently, as we all understand, we really have a one, an ad hoc, one-off system. Um, there's almost no management, there's no planning, it's just kind of, if something breaks, we fix it. If we can get a bond passed, we do it. The stormwater utility would intend to have a cohesive drainage management structure so that we would do projects when they are necessary and we can rank them and we can you know, be a little bit more proactive in our planning. You know, we've had bond fundings and other sources of fundings, but again, it's ad hoc funding. Stormwater utility can create a dedicated revenue stream that can really, you know, push our planning forward. Um, the cost causer is not always the cost payer on the current system. People with large parking lots may or may not be paying their fair share. Um, if you're not a taxpayer, a property pa taxpayer, you're one of the uh, nonprofits or so on, you're not paying. So the stormwater utility would create an equitable distribution of costs. And then today we have minimal incentives to have good stormwater management practices. Rain gardens, I remember a couple of years ago we had a push to do rain gardens, but it kind of petered out. So, you know, if you do it or if you don't do it, you really don't get credit for it. The stormwater utility would incentivize good practices and you would be getting most likely credit towards uh, your, your cost. So if you're a large parking lot owner and you put in rain gardens, it probably would offset your cost. So going backwards again, that was the intent of, of where we, of, of what came out of our 2019 document. So doing a delta view side by side, I've heard a lot about phase one and phase two. Obviously, this is the recommendations for phase one and we're now in phase two. So phase one um, was anticipated to be a standalone, non-regulated utility. Phase two is anticipated to be a utility commingled with the two utilities that constitute AWU, water and sewer, and would be stormwater would be th third utility. Um, it would be certificated up front. The original concept was non-certificated, and that makes a big difference as we see here. <coughs> also, although it is not certain that we will or will not be economically regulated once it's stood up, we're preparing for economic regulation because that's one of very possible option of where we may end up being. So you can't, hopefully you can see this because there's a nice white spot right over this, but the master plan that was referenced in, in the January 2019 document has, because of those, because of the uh, RCA component and the AWU component has morphed into a CPCN, their Certificate of Public Convenience and Necessity by the RCA. The organizational structure, which was going to be a study onto itself has morphed into AWU. We have an organizational structure, and that's part of the idea about having us do this, is we're not gonna recreate the wheel here, we're gonna use the efficiencies of, that we already have with two utilities. And then a rate structure, which was going to be a kind of a standalone initiative, is now morphed into the CPCN, which is, in fact, a rate structure. Excuse me. Mr. Wilson? I have some questions, but yes. we don't have yeah. a lot of time. Watch the presentation. I'm, I'm, we have time for questions. Five minutes and I'm done. I'm open to starting, and my co chair is starting the budget committee a little late. Uh, yeah, that's fine. Yeah, totally so fine with that. This is important enough. Let's run another okay. 10 minutes or so. Okay, so um, do you want to take questions now? Uh, let me, Mark, or let me get through this. Through? I know where you're going. I know where you're going. Okay. okay. Um, so, what we've done is, of course, we were, ta we, AWU, were tasked with uh, putting out the RFP, which we did. We've uh, 
are in negotiations with the contractor on the scope and fee. So I, this presentation will not talk about the, the cost of what we're doing here because I don't have that yet. I don't have the fee schedule. And I don't even have a complete scope uh, prepared just yet. The scope and fee will be in a contract that will most likely go in, in front of the assembly. Um, normally when we do this kind of work, the contractors don't know our budget. In this case, it's been well advertised that we're at 1.5 million. I expect that we're going to probably spend at least a million dollars on this effort, if not more. Um, AWU has to retain a contingency and pay for some of its own internal costs, which includes legal. Because as we file for the CPCN, that is what AWU will be doing with our internal legal folks, not what a contractor would do for us. The contract deliverables. The main contract deliverable out of this whole effort is the CPCN. What I hope the contractor can deliver to me is a package that I can hand to my attorney who can hand it to the RCA and make the filing. That is it. In order, uh, critical components of the CPCN, and you may have seen this before, the management, the benefit to the public, the service areas and utility practices and procedures, as well as specific financial requirements. So those things must be the product of this effort. The specific financial requirements, you've seen this before too. Revenues, expenses, depreciation, cost of capital, return, um, proposed rates. Everything that, everything that you'd want to know about a utility is going to be in the document that gets filed with the RCA. The point being, the minute that they say, yep, you're good to go, you have a utility that you can operate. Another contract deliverable, which has been stressed uh, repeatedly by the assembly, is public outreach. So we're gonna have a significant, robust public outreach campaign. Probably more so than was originally anticipated, uh, but that's what I've been hearing. Unless we wanna pull back on it, it's gonna be fairly significant. And public outreach campaign includes, among other things, updates to the assembly and to the assembly subcommittee um, we're going to have a public involvement uh, plan put together, so we've got a contractor to do that. It's going to be a subcontractor to uh, our chosen contractor. When you're doing public outreach, every time you're doing something, what you're going to do is you're going to do you're going to inform the public, right? Then you're and part of that information is you're going to educate the public, and then you're going to get the response. Well, so now that you know what's going on and you understand what's going on, what do you think about what's going on? And then as we get that feedback loop going, it will help inform our decisions going forward. This does take time and money. This is not going to be, I've heard the number of 250,000 was once floated as that should be the component. I think that might be light. Now, we have a lot of outstanding issues. And the guy who knows all about the known and the unknown, <laughs> if anybody remembers this quote, that's kind of what we're looking at here. There's a lot of things I discover on a day-to-day -day basis about a stormwater utility. And he said it, there it's are the known unknowns, and then there's the unknown unknowns. Well, we've got them all. Let's hope that it turns out SFU is a little bit better than the war in Iraq. Right, the next slide has SAP <laughs> on it. <laughs> if it doesn't, <laughs> okay, schedule risks. I've got three pages of identified issues here, and then I'll probably have, again, more issues that I don't know anything about yet. Schedule risks, obviously, litigation, software implementation, we're running into software implementation issues, uh, expanded public outreach. Well, we'll see how the public reacts and what kind of schedule pushes that out. SAP configuration. I'm uncertain exactly how that's gonna look. We're gonna have to configure it with SAP, and there's an unknown risk there. There's also complexities associated with our internal billing system and the CAMA system. We're not being playing with both of those software packages. We are doing an internal update on the CIS system. It's three years, it's zero to three years. And then three years out, we'll have a different system. So we may have a tiered billing or a phased in billing system. We may not have the billing system long term uh, that we would have within the first three years, and that's a software implementation. We have collectability issues that we need to handle. Obviously, you can't turn off the collection of stormwater. We also don't turn off sewer. So if you don't pay your sewer bill, not a lot we can do about it. If you don't pay your stormwater bill, maybe there's not a lot we can do either unless you're an AWU customer. And even then, I'm not sure that we can do 
what others have done, which is a tranche to collection system. I mean, you could, concepts like liens may need to be considered. We've got a risk with the DOT, public facilities cooperation, they use different standards. Muni uh, state interfaces are always complicated, complicated by politics, if nothing else. And then level of service, they may have a different level of service requirements. Um, asset ownership. Who owns the pipes? Who owns the facilities? Which do we finance? Which do we not finance? Those into depreciation, MUSA, dividend, and financing. The DOT gets 90-10 participation on their capital projects. If we take it over, we may not get that. So it may be that asset ownership becomes a piecemeal kind of thing. Obviously, we have the service area and the independent areas. How do we handle those? Then invoicing. We generally, AWU has a monthly billing cycle. Um, this may or may not have a monthly billing cycle. It may be tied to the semi-annual tax bill, which goes into a software issue of camera. Uh, contract milestones. So we hope to execute the contract in December. Uh, it's gonna most likely take assembly approval, so you'll see it, uh, we'll see if we can't get it done by the end of the year, that would be the goal. Uh, phase two report will be before the assembly for approval of the third quarter of 2021. So keep in mind 2019, 2020, 2021. About uh, six to seven quarters to get us there. Uh, we're going to start the public camp outreach, um, it's called a campaign the program, first quarter of 2020. That's assuming you know we get the contract in place at the end of this year. We're going to have a potential rate structures uh, come together by the third quarter of 2020. And we're gonna have that recommendation hopefully cemented by the first quarter of 2021. Quarters of the public campaign, the public outreach and feedback is very important to this. So we're kind of going on a quarterly basis because it takes time to get that accomplished. Uh, this RCA CPCN process is anywhere from six to nine months. So as soon as we know that the assembly is approved in the third quarter of 2021, you're really first, second, quarter of 2022, I see that your first bill would go out middle of 2022. Again, would that be monthly or be associated with the tax bill? It might impact the timing. And with that, questions? Thank you, Mr. Shimsheimer. We'll plan to go five minutes over since we've got the budget meeting afterwards. We've got uh, Mr. Whittleton, Mr. Constant, Ms. Zelatel, Mr. Dyson, and Mr. Dunmore. Um, or Dunbar, sorry, <laughs> going too fast. And Ms. Kennedy in the queue. So Mr. Whittleton. Three and they're not too quick. Well, if they're, if they're quick. One is, I, do we have a stormwater utility subcommittee? If there is one, it's you and Ms. LaFrance. Then we have this committee, and then we have the body. Okay, that was mentioned that there was one. I don't know, we can start with Yeah. <coughs> right, and and so what I imagined you were saying, if I might, is just that we have this committee that's dealing with these issues. Yeah, and then there could be a subcommittee, and as I just suggested, if there is one already formed, you two are the leads, and so um, there could be a body that forms. Okay, and okay. Sorry, so this one okay. and a half million, we're hearing a lot of different uses for that, and stuff. I'm getting because my understanding was clear outline of that is we got about half a million to do the study then we have an extra million is to help stand up the utility before the bills go out and start funding it and also to cover legal challenges now i'm hearing oh these consultants know you have a million and a half for the study so if i heard you right today you know, everybody not, knows we have a million and a half for the study but no because i'm here i heard four hundred thousand and four fifty then they like, think i heard occasionally five hundred but i never heard of Is that what you said? You can say it might happen study of you. In order to get to where we want to go, it's going to take most likely a million and a half dollars plus I'm going to pursue grant funds. I've been going after several avenues of grant funds to do add-on activities that aren't representative that I think are necessary. But I would suspect that at the end of the day, in order to accomplish everything that we've been talking about, when we finally get down to real numbers with real consultants, whether they know the budget or not, you are in the million dollar plus range. Okay, so the million, get where you want to be, does that include then a year of cash flows while you wait for the billing? So I that's do not believe so. Now our 
thousand dollar study has gone up to a million and a half. Okay. That would be a yes. Can I move to extend by ten minutes? <laughs> um, yes. Okay. Well, that's fake news to me. One last. No, that's fine. Okay. Last. Form. Okay, and it's um, you showed on one of your earlier slides phase one and then some phase two, and there have been very big decisions made between those two. And um, I guess it's a comment that some very big decisions made uh, between those two. Yes, we'll have some guidance to help you fill that space. Right, the, you know, but back to your the, the numbers. When the contract is brought before the assembly, the numbers should be clear as to what we're going to pay for to do what. And that's when the numbers become real. To that point, it's all been budgetary projections. Keep in mind, we haven't stood up utility recently. So these are the best budgetary guesses <coughs> we can come up with at any given time. Mr. Uh, said actually would like to, sorry to interrupt. I, I, I just want to add, in terms of the, the difference in a lot of the, the money, yes, there is a lot of work that is going to be done, but I think a very large increase in what we are going to see is a result of everything that we've heard from the assembly and the public in which they want a robust public engagement campaign. And that is going to cost a lot of money. And while we weren't necessarily looking at doing as large of one, I think all the feedback that we have received from the members of this body and the public during all of these work sessions is that that's what they want. So that is what we are going to give them, but that is obviously going to cost money, and that's going to increase the cost. Okay, thank you, Mr. Parkinson. We'll go ahead and move on, Mr. Whittleton, to the next person, if that's okay. I know you have, you have other questions. Mr. Constant? Thanks. Um, so I would be careful that framing, it's going to cost a whole bunch more for the public outreach process. In my understanding, the public outreach process was always part of this conversation that we weren't going to be able to get there without it. And so hopefully that does fall within the scope of the already leveraged $1.5 million so that when we're done, we have the funds for the study and the master plan process, the funds already available for the outreach process, and then the first legs into whatever the next steps are. And so and I never understood this to be a process where we had to append an extraordinary fund to do public outreach, and so we should. This has always been a part of the conversation. The public will be involved. I would be very careful to anybody to suggest that we weren't. It's just maybe we're going to be more robust about it because of the intense focus. And so um, that's. I just would add that, and I would also suggest in your slides, if you go back to the beginning, if this becomes kind of a, a roadshow, that. Um, you may begin with the public outreach slide as an element that's very important because you kind of started with we, we're going to have a document, a product from this effort that we can submit to the RCA. And then you start talking about public outreach. Before you talk about a product to the RCA, I believe you should already, in your roadshow, have talked about public outreach just as a matter of course. Yeah. You know, because otherwise it looks like the public outreach is an appendage that is just there to appease as opposed to an integral part of the conversation. Okay, thank you, Mr. Constant. Ms. Zelotel? Um, thank you. Actually, that set up my comment very uh, well. On your public outreach slide, you said inform, educate, and respond, and those are all things we were going to do to the public, and we don't have an input piece in that. It feels very much like we are going to tell the public at these points what's happening, what does it mean, and what do you think about it now when we're responding to we need to add that input piece so we definitely have that public comment or solicitation um that's that's just my feedback on that but i think it's really important okay thank you Ms. zelato any comments oh, point taken. okay yeah i i for the chair I, I, mean, I think that's a very good point i mean I, I i don't see this being you know in terms of how we engage the public a whole lot different than what we do on major road projects where we do set up and we do, I mean, uh, I'll take Spinard for example. I, I don't know how many, you know, public sessions we had at different high schools, at different stores around that area where all we did was invite the public in and said, tell us what you think, tell us what you want. And we gathered all that information and we responded to that. So I, I would assume that this is gonna be very similar, but on a, 
you know, Anchorage Bowl scale. Thank you. Mr. Dyson? Yeah, I wish I didn't have to say this. Well organized and very well done. I keep saying, don't use professional jargon and acronyms without defending them. Uh, defining them. This is the worst I've seen, <laughs> you know, in probably 10 years. And uh, it takes you thinking about who am I talking to and what do they understand. And we're trying to be informed, but then we're going to put this out to the public and it's even worse. So consider yourself nagged, but think about who you're talking about, and define your terms, and think about just being really good at communicating. Thank you. Good point, Fred. Pointing. Thank you, Mr. Dyson. Mr. Dunbar. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. And I'll try to structure this as a question, so let's see if I can do that, uh, because we're getting a lot of comments. But if you look at the second the second to last uh, slide, I think the second to last slide, and I guess I would urge everyone who presents, please number your slides. It makes things a lot easier. But I think the second to last slide, okay, yeah, here. So phase two report. Um, you know, Mr. Weddleton had a, an ordinance that I ended up voting for that failed 6-5 to say you need to get some kind of original rate structure or even like a, what you call it, a rate, uh, what was the term you ended up using? Rate structure, rate structure study. So that when you go out to the public, you, so I, but my point is you start the, pro the project introduction reaching out to the public in quarter one, 2020, but then you don't have a potential rate structure until quarter three, 2020. To me, that's two wasted quarters. Because if you're going out to the public and saying, here's what we plan to do, and you've got no sense of what the rate structure is going to be, then I think you are, I, I think that they, they're not going to be as engaged, and they are not going to give you feedback that's actually going to be super useful. They're going to be like, oh yeah, this sounds great, this sounds good, and then you're going to get to it, and they're going to be like, oh wait, no, this is what it's going to cost. So I guess I just want assurances, or a description of how you're going to do it. How are you going to get the, the potential rate structure as early as possible so that you're actually having substantive conversation with the public as opposed to something that sounds sounds good but actually doesn't get their true feelings on the subject. So as you can see, so we've got the potential rate structure rolled out in Q3 2020, you know, six to eight months after the introduction of the project. I suspect as we introduce the project, we're going to have a potential rate, a multitude of potential rate structures that we can put in front of the public and say, feedback, what do you think? Okay. Are we going to have numbers associated with this? I don't think we're going to have numbers associated with it up front. Um, it's a, it's, so it's a half million dollar contract, right? And we're going to have the opportunity to vote on the contract again. Is that right or wrong? Yes, yes. Yes. So can we make, as a part of that contract, some... $10,000, $20,000, whatever it is, some something that can have what you just described, and maybe even a little more robust than that. So it's, here is the basic rate structure, and maybe here are some potential numbers. Can that be done? Yes. I, I wouldn't put a dollar figure on doing it. I would just say that that's kind of the nature of the work. Um, you don't want to get too far out of the sequence of this, but I, sure. I, I recognize the concern here. I mean, Mr. Weddleton's had the same concern over time. Is when do we get stuff in front of us quickly so that we can we can get moving on this? Um, I hear you, and yes, we can. We can you'll see that probably represented yeah. in the contract. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Mr. Dunbar. I've had that same concern as well. And Mr. Bakkenstein, I would, I would just add that just because we say quarter one, 2020 project introduction, that doesn't mean that's when we're starting a full-on public engagement campaign. That is, hey, we now have a contractor on board. Here is the project that we're going to be doing, and we will have kind of the scope and all of the work that we're going to be doing. There is a lot of work that we are going to have to do quarter one, quarter two of 2020 to be able to put information in so that we do have a potential rate structure in quarter three. So it's not like it's two wasted quarters. It is a lot of work that's going to be happening, and as I've said repeatedly, there is all of these factors that are going to play into what that rate structure and what those rates look like. So there will be a lot of work and the public will slowly be engaged as we get, gather more information. Okay, thank you. We have two more people in the queue, Ms. Kennedy, then Mr. Constant, we have two minutes. Thank you, Ms. Chair. Um, my, one of my questions, I have two. One of my questions is just in regard to the idea of invoicing and um, one of those being, if it's a 
a monthly thing. I mean, that, won't the utility actually, RCA, won't they actually <coughs> drive that decision? Because um, we're talking about um, getting people who aren't even on the tax, who aren't property taxpayers, to basically be paying for this utility. So I guess I'm confused about the idea about how you use property tax annual billing to actually bill for a utility. It is a complex issue that we're going to have to resolve and get through. It, it, when you start this discussion, you open up a can of worms that goes on quite a ways because, of course, people who don't pay property taxes aren't on the system. Isn't that um, the reason for the utility? The Part utility has <laughs> options in how to bill its, its utility bill. It could very well be associated with the property tax bill, but of course it has to then go out to people who don't pay property taxes as well. There are a multitude of other issues that we had a half an hour to get into uh, associated with land ownership, the bill to the landowner versus the bill to a tenant, potentially. And the systems look at them differently. So it's a complex issue. Um, we can have this discussion. This is going to be really part of the work of the, of the next six to nine months is to have that discussion about how we invoice it. But does the RCA have a say in this? Yes, yes they do, but they don't necessarily mandate you shall do this. It's more as we bring it to them and they go, yes, this is agreeable to us. Okay, thank you. Did you have one, one question? more question? Yes, and that's in regard to one of the things that I haven't heard much about in terms of financing. Once this utility kicks in, we still have debt, bond indebtedness for other past projects. So um, how are those going to be continued to be paid? Because obviously the idea is to offset the costs in the budget for our stormwater um, infrastructure. And the idea is we would no longer bond for those projects. But what happens to that past debt, whatever we have for those projects? How is that worked into the system? Is it not? Are people still going to be basically on the hook for the debt through the regular budget process? Excellent question. I think Jason's got this. Mr. Yes, uh, through the chair, because those were uh, voter approved uh, in a certain area, those will have to be carried through. Uh, the property taxes until they're paid off. We want, unless we had an entire vote of uh, the uh, proposed area and said, we want to take all of the past voter approved bond debt and move it over to uh, the utility. Uh, if, if we don't do that or if there's no support for that, then the bonds that have already been approved would be carried until they're paid off. Are you having that conversation and have an idea about how much that yes. costs? How much is okay. okay? Thank you. Final comments, yeah. Mr. Constance. So, in the context of this question of taking some money and putting up front a rate structure, I would just add that what I think is the most valuable path forward on that is to set before everyone a set of potential rate structures. It could be this way. It could be this way. It could be this way. And with maybe even a slider, we're paying half a million dollars that shows the progressive change of cost who pays and how it's paid. That, I think, is the tool that will provide the public with the best amount of opportunity to give us input. Well, this one actually looks like what's most reasonable to me. And not come forward with a rate structure that says this is what we're going to push out. And then try to run that through to the end to where we get to the first quarter potential rate structure. I think the rate structure that's there should come from a process of narrowing down of potential opportunities proposed to us by the contractor. Okay, thank you, Mr. Constant. And with that, we don't have time for audience participation. We are adjourned.